Es muy buenos días con todos, siendo las 11 de la mañana en Lima, eh, tengo el gusto de inaugurar esta tercera mesa de discusión en las jornadas de investigación sobre teoría crítica. Um, quisiera empezar con unas cuantas cuestiones técnicas acerca de la mesa. I would like to start with some technical um, remarks. Um, so, each panel will last 120 minutes. Each speaker will have 30 to 35 minutes for the presentation. After both presentations, the commentator will have 10 minutes to ask questions to both speakers, after which each speaker will have 10 minutes to respond. In the remaining time, questions from the public and other participants will be answered. About the questions from the public, your questions could be formulated by the Zoom chat, and I will read them to the speakers at the end of the panel. Um, ahora en español, la mesa tendrá una duración total de 120 minutos. Cada ponente tendrá entre 30 y 35 minutos para realizar su presentación. Después de las dos presentaciones, la persona encargada de los comentarios tendrá 10 minutos para formular preguntas a ambos ponentes. Y cada uno de ellos tendrá 10 minutos para responderlas. En el tiempo restante, las preguntas del público y otros participantes podrán ser respondidas. Sobre las preguntas del público, estas podrán ser formuladas solo a través del chat de Zoom para que el moderador, o sea yo, las lea a los ponentes al final de la mesa. Entonces, quisiera eh, empezar presentando al profesor Robin Selicates. I will begin by presenting Professor Robin Selicates. He is Professor of Social Philosophy at the Free University um, in Berlin and Co-Director of the Center for Humanities and Social Change. Among his important publications are Social Philosophy, an Introduction, published in 2017, co-written with Rachel Yegi, and Critique of Social Practice, published in 2009 in German and translated to English in 2018. Quisiera empezar entonces presentando al profesor Robin Selicates, quien es profesor de filosofía social en la Universidad Libre de Berlín y co-director del Centro para las Humanidades y el Cambio Social. Entre sus publicaciones importantes están Filosofía Social, una introducción publicada en 2017 y co-escrito con Rachel Yegi, así como Crítica como Praxis Social, eh, publicada en el 2009 en alemán y traducido al inglés en el 2018. La ponencia que vamos a escuchar el día de hoy se titula Rehaciendo el Demos desde Abajo, Teoría Crítica, Luchas Migratorias y Resistencias Epistémicas. The presentation we will hear today is called Remaking the Demos from Below, Critical Theory, Migrant Struggles and Epistemic Resistance. Professor Salicates, whenever you are ready, I'll begin to share my screen now. Buenos días a todos y buenas tardes. Um, muchas gracias por Uh, la amable presentación, Rodrigo, y muchas gracias a Gianfranco por la invitación. Um, es un gran placer uh, para mí a volver a las uh, jornadas. Tengo muy uh, buenos recuerdos de la última visita y, uh, por supuesto, espero que podamos encontrarnos uh, otra vez en el futuro en Lima. Um, yo voy a presentar mi texto en inglés, uh, pero um, también pueden hacer las preguntas en español. Okay, and I think um, <clears throat> the text is visible already and I hope you can all hear me well. All right, I'll start with a um, scene from a couple of years ago. Mohamed Zataire wakes up early in the morning of Friday, September 4, 2015. The 25 year old refugee had left his home more than half a year earlier and has been sleeping rough at the Keleti train station in Budapest for several nights, together with a growing number of refugees, mostly fleeing the devastating war in Syria. More than 3,000 of them are now in makeshift camps at the train station without proper access to sanitation, food, medical help, stuck without a viable perspective after the Hungarian government suspended international train and bus travel. Together with his friend, Ahmed, Mohammed decides to leave this unbearable situation and to mobilize people to walk towards the Austrian border, 170 kilometers from Budapest. They realize that their chances of actually crossing the border depend on numbers and visibility. Shortly after noon, the refugees start getting organized. They assemble in rows and start walking. Their march sets off in the direction of Vienna and quickly grows to over 2,000 people. They decide to walk via the highway, even as the police try to stop them, increasing their visibility and securing much needed media attention. Now there's in parallel um, a kind of other political scene in which uh, governments and ministers are conferring by phone and meeting. 
Um, and shortly after midnight, the German and Austrian governments decide to open their borders to suspend the EU border regime and to allow the refugees to cross the borders. Although the politicians frame their decision as a humanitarian exception, limited to a small number of refugees, in truth, they had already conceded that the political force behind this historical, if momentary, shift in policy was not the government, but the March of Hope, as it came to be called on social media. The political iconography of the march came to symbolize the collapse of the EU border regime, as well as the capacity of refugees and migrants to collectively assert and perform their right to mobility, protesting the, the lack of safe and legal routes across the borders of Europe. As Marched, another one of the refugees on the march put it, when we walk, we make our own decision. We don't wait for others to give us solutions. Stand up, my people. We all stand up. Go walk. The quote is from a documentary movie about the march that uh, The Guardian has produced. In what follows, I focus on migrant and refugee activism during the so-called summer of migration as an example for how political struggles can play an active role in producing rather than just responding to crises as well as producing knowledge about them. The epistemic and political significance of this knowledge is spelled out with reference to the standpoint theoretical insight that it is often precisely those who are subjected to social oppression and thereby epistemically marginalized who turn out to be epistemically privileged with regard to identifying crises for what they are. And they can thus also constitute driving forces of democratic innovation. In the case of migrants, it is literally those at the margins who run into and push against boundaries most people in the global north have never directly experienced and are not aware of. They thus force the more privileged to confront the ways both the internal and the external borders of the state function, potentially reconfiguring um, what the African-American feminist Bell Hooks calls imposed marginality as a site of deprivation into a space of radical openness and a site of radical possibility, a space of resistance from which counter-hegemonic discourse can emerge and unfold its transformative force. Building on the case of migrant and refugee activism and the ways in which it theorizes, denaturalizes, and politicizes borders, I will highlight the production of knowledge about crises that takes place within social and political movements that are ordinarily only seen as responses to pre-existing crises. While the pre-existing crises, primarily economic, political, and social crises in the countries of origin, are of course real enough, and take a prominent, indeed, determining place in the public imagination, the crises at the border and more generally the border regime itself as a permanent crisis, so crisis not as a moment or an exception, but as a structure or as normality indeed, only rarely piece the mental cordon sanitaire that pops up the lethal logic of the border regime around us. The opening forced by Muhammad, Majd, and their fellow refugees points us beyond this logic to a different understanding of borders and of migration, and ultimately, I will argue, of citizenship and democracy. I come to the first section, standpoint theory and the social and political construction of crisis uh, from below. The example of the march of refugees from Budapest to the Austrian border and then on to Germany, as well as other instances of refugee activism before, during, and after the summer of migration, provides a powerful illustration for how, in Martin Luther King's famous words, political struggles seek to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community is forced to confront the issue it managed to ignore for too long. The more general theoretical claim this suggests is that different forms of street politics, from mass marches via direct action, civil disobedience to riots and uprisings, can not only be seen as responses to or symptoms of crises, but as active agents in producing crises and critical and emancipatory knowledge about them. A knowledge that can also counteract objectivist tendencies in critical theory that see crises merely or primarily in terms of structural contradictions and ignore or underestimate the crisis producing and crisis enhancing effects of social and political movements. These forms of politics from below are then not only to be understood as often quite sophisticated and theoretically informed forms of critique, 
but their epistemological significance goes further and involves a kind of epistemic reversal. It is often precisely those who are subjected to social oppression and thereby epistemically marginalized who turn out to be epistemically privileged with regard to identifying crises for what they are. This, of course, is the general inside of standpoint theory, which is also applicable, I want to show, to thinking about borders and migration, and which remains of crucial importance to any critical theory that seeks to avoid the reproduction of epistemic asymmetries. Two more concrete claims can spell out this general insight and help to show that the orientation towards actual practices of critique does not stand in opposition to the critical potential of critical theories. Actual practices of critique can indeed lead to a more complex understanding of how crises unfold and how they are co-produced. The first is the socio-epistemological claim that societies are not epistemically homogeneous spaces made up of similarly situated epistemic subjects who are to roughly the same degree subject or not to ideological distortion, for example. Rather, societies are epistemically fragmented, especially along the lines of class, gender, and race, and thus encompass different positionalities so that members of dominant and dominated groups will be subject to different group-specific epistemic, cognitive, but also affective, perceptive, and mnemonic, so memory-related constraints. The second insight is the historical sociological claim that um, <clears throat> epistemic constraints primarily negatively affect epistemic subjects who are members of dominant groups, while members of dominated groups can turn out to be epistemically privileged with regard to an adequate understanding of social relations of domination, precisely due to their specific positionality. This privilege is not due to some inherent capacity or mysterious access to the truth, but rather to specific and sociologically specifiable experiences and practices. As W.E.B. Du Bois argues, the double consciousness and second sight of those who are born within what he calls the veil, so African Americans in the US, is an effect of the structural racism they are subjected to and the need to navigate it. It forces and at the same time enables them to develop the capacity to entertain two perspectives, two ways of thinking, and two ways of looking at and navigating the social world. It is this experience that allows them to see the hegemonic standpoint, the white standpoint, for what it is, namely a standpoint, rather than fall for the universal perspective as which it presents itself to those who inhabit it without needing to question it. In a similar vein, Patricia Hill Collins speaks of the knowledge and practical wisdom required for survival by the subordinate, especially in her case, black women who live as outsiders within at the intersection of different social worlds. Again, it is the social world they are confronted with, which both forces and allows them to develop their own practices of knowledge and theory production and validation. Members of such dominated groups thus potentially partake in what Jose Medina calls meta-lucidity. I quote, meta-lucid subjects are those who are aware of the effects of oppression in our cognitive structures and of the limitations in the epistemic practices of seeing, talking, hearing, reasoning, etc., that are grounded in relations of oppression. For example, the invisibilization of certain phenomena, experiences, problems, and even entire subjectivities. Oppressed subjects are in a better position to achieve these insights because they are the very embodiment of those cognitive limitations and suffer directly the cognitive biases and vitiated cognitive structures that support the relations of oppression." End of quote. These two claims seem to contradict a powerful line of thought in critical theory, which locates social ignorance and ideology on the side of the oppressed and such and sees such ignorance and ideology as functional requirements for the smooth reproduction of the status quo. Think of Althusser and um, many other theorists in the Marxist tradition. If one subscribes to this line of thought, theory has very little to learn from dominated groups. And of course, standpoint epistemology directly contrasts with this. Now, standpoint epistemology is sometimes criticized for naively assuming that positionality, locating, uh, inhabiting a social position, um, somewhat automatically translates into epistemic privilege and that the very idea of positionality, positionally enabled epistemic privilege 
opens the door to subjectivism and particularism. Both criticisms rely on a misunderstanding and simplification of standpoint theory that a careful reading of the classical texts, Du Bois and Collins, for example, would readily expose. First, most standpoint theorists explicitly emphasize that a critical standpoint is never a given. It is the result of hard work and of struggle, both epistemically and politically. Second, most standpoint theorists emphasize that standpoints and their epistemic advantages and disadvantages cannot simply be asserted, but they stand in need of sociological and historical substantiation. Neither are all groups confronted with the same practical necessity of understanding and navigating existing relations of domination and oppression, nor do all of them have the same kind of emancipatory interest in overcoming the status quo. But these, the need to navigate the social world and the emancipatory interest, are precisely the two primary sources of alternative critical epistemologies. In addition, both Du Bois and Collins uh, point to subaltern cultural practices, institutional structures, and publics that provide the concrete and material conditions of possibility for the emergence, articulation, and validation of standpoints that cut off the alleged slippery slope into relativism and arbitrariness some critics of standpoint theory seem so worried about. What is more, bringing invisibilized and marginalized counter-hegemonic forms of knowledge, critique, and resistance to the fore precisely aims at rectifying, at least partially, the glaring lack of objectivity that characterizes hegemonic forms of knowledge despite their self-certification as neutral and universal. This unmasking of the presumably universal as particular, of a perspective as a perspective, should be familiar enough to critical theorists as it is among the fundamental tools in the arsenal of ideology critique. Standpoint theory has some important implications for critical theory that should be evident even on the basis of this very truncated summary of what is, after all, a long and complex theoretical tradition. At least some ideologies, racism is maybe the most obvious case, seem to primarily, although, although of course not exclusively, impose epistemic constraints on the members of dominant groups, blocking them from developing an adequate understanding of social relations of domination. In my view, the same holds for ideologies connected to borders and migration when they are conceptualized from the perspectives of citizens whose privileges are constituted and protected by the border regime in question and whose identities are often shaped by it. The alternative standpoints and corresponding counter-hegemonic practices and forms of knowledge established and articulated by members of dominated groups can thus provide crucial epistemic resources that inform a theoretically informed as well as politically relevant social critique from below. A type of epistemic resistance that mobilizes epistemic resources and capacities against social structures of domination and oppression and the cognitive and effective mechanisms that contribute to their reproduction. Insofar as critical theory can be seen, to quote a recent paper by Axel Honneth, as nothing but the continuation by means of a controlled scientific methodology of the cognitive labor that oppressed groups have to perform in their everyday struggles when they work to denaturalize hegemonic patterns of interpretation and to expose the interests by which these are motivated, these forms of epistemic resistance have a dual significance for critical theory. First, they can anchor the perspective of critical theory within social reality and thus help it redeem one of its foundational claims, a claim that you find in the classical texts by Horkheimer, Marx, and many others, namely that critical theory should be grounded in oppositional forms of practice, of consciousness, and actually existing practices of critique and resistance, and sort of feed back into them. Second, they can serve as a counterweight in the sense of the reflexive accountability that Collins talks about to the tendency of actually existing critical theories to set in motion a disempowering spiral of, of epistemic asymmetries that denies the existence of theoretically sophisticated practices of critique and resistance on the ground and thereby reproduces rather than transforms existing obstacles to equal participation in knowledge production. Um, I come to the uh, second uh, section, migrant struggles, struggles as epistemic resistance. With their struggles, migrants challenge the self-understanding of those who regard them as strangers in our midst, 
to quote a book title by the political theorist David Miller. As if they come out of nowhere, and for reasons that are completely unrelated to one's own political community and its past and current place in the world. They confront what uh, Wissen and Brandt have called our imperial way of life and the public amnesia that shields it with historical contexts and continuities, as well as persisting forms of economic and political domination beyond the nation state. This public amnesia is a form of motivated ignorance that Charles Mills calls global white ignorance, the refusal to acknowledge, I quote, that a system of illicit racial empowerment and disablement inherited from the past may still be at work reproducing unfair advantage and handicap at different racial poles through a wide variety of interlocking societal mechanisms, end of quote. Prominent slogans of migrant movements, such as we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us, and we are here because you were or you are there, serve to highlight this historical connection and its political implications against the immunization mechanisms of white ignorance that seek to shield existing relations of domination from being criticized and challenged. And that's the point that Rahel emphasized in her talk yesterday, when she was talking in reference to these slogans as well, to the actual forms of connection, to the actual forms of association that are already there, but that we often fail to recognize, but that solidarity would require uh, um, us to recognize. The March of Refugees can precisely serve to highlight the case for recognizing epistemic agency and resistance as essential aspects of migrant struggles. On their way, migrants in the march held up signs with slogans denouncing the unjust, dominating, and cruel nature of the international border regime and claiming human rights, freedom of movement, and access to asylum procedures, often just invoking the legal rights that under international law they should actually have but are denied in practice. In a powerful and politically effective way, the march formulated and enacted a radical critique of the border regime informed by both lived experience and a sophisticated sense of what is wrong with the regime, often invoking the official normative commitments of the citizens and politicians of the countries whose borders it was crossing. This critique was at the same time imminent, anchored in an experience of this very regime, and radical, rejecting its functioning rather than seeking to modify it or just to evade it. The knowledge it is tied up with should be seen as a form of epistemic resistance that challenges the regime's own attempts at invisibilization and whitewashing. In addition to articulating an emerging form of political subjectivity and transnational solidarity that opens up new political alliances beyond simplistic invocations of a unified people and regressive national, nationalist populist tendencies also on the left, the march thus also provides an important example of the epistemic agency of refugees and migrants. Most people in the West never or rarely directly experience the borders these migrants confront, run into, seek to cross, shift, and circumvent. And this fundamental difference leads to a difference in knowledge and awareness that is both politically and epistemically significant. The corresponding shift of perspective leads to a more complex understanding of how the internal and external borders of the state, or in the European case of the EU, function, and that the so-called crisis is not the momentary breakdown of an otherwise well-functioning system, but its very operandi, its very modus operandi. It is precisely this modus operandi that migrant struggles and movements have the potential to uncover, articulate, denaturalize, and politicize thus making it into the object of an emancipatory form of knowledge production whose relevance has been recognized by critical migration studies, but remains largely, largely ignored by critical theorists and political philosophers. Refugee and migrant struggles and movements not only manifest a specific kind of constituent power, namely the power to initiate a reconstitution of borders and categories of membership by denaturalizing, politicizing, and democratizing them, in so doing, they also articulate a form of emancipatory knowledge that contemporary critical theory, at least insofar as it seeks to move beyond the confines of methodological nationalism, ignores at its own peril. Again, the claim is not that all migrant struggles and movements do that, or do that in the same way. The point rather is to show how in specific case, 
features of migration and borders become or are made visible that any theorizing about migration and borders that claims to be empirically adequate, critical, and politically responsible needs to take into account. Minimally, this shift in perspective, seeing like a migrant instead of seeing like a state, requires us to move beyond the dominant understanding of the refugee and the migrant of borders and of migration from the point of view of stasis, of non-movement, and of states who claim the authority and the capacity to unilaterally control and regulate movement. In contrast, what is, what is called for and what the practice of migration prefigures and generates as knowledge is a more complex understanding of migration that is not primarily determined by lack, anomaly, or failure, all forms of othering, of course, that then are also uh, attached to migrants themselves, and that challenges ahistorical rationalizations of fundamentally racist forms of exclusion and selection. As suggested by standpoint theory, more generally, refugees and migrants can lay claim to this specific type of knowledge precisely because of their marginalized position, as they both need to understand and navigate the social and political space of the border regime and have a fundamental interest in developing the kind of knowledge needed for circumventing or overcoming the obstacles that this regime represents for them. In fact, they are the very embodiment, as Medina uh, put it, of those cognitive limitations, and they expose and undermine them at the same time. Put schematically, and this is very brief, so the complexities uh, can hopefully be addressed in the discussion, there are, I think, three insights about borders as, as complex social institutions and three insights about migration as a complex social practice that can serve as illustrations of the kinds of knowledge produced in migration that go beyond the mere creation of counter narratives. First, borders do not simply has, have a derived or secondary status as if they were simply drawing the line between those who belong and those who don't, as if the border between France and Germany is just the border that separates two entities that pre-exist, namely France on the one hand and Germany on the other hand, or French, <laughs> the French people on the one hand and the German people on the other hand. Borders instead are essentially productive, generative, and constitutive, for example, of the very entities that are supposedly uh, just delineated by them, and of course of the difference between citizens and migrants and between different categories of migrants. Second, borders are no longer exclusively or primarily at the border, at the limits of the state territory, but they have proliferated towards the interior as well as towards the exterior of the political community and been diffused into borderscapes following those not deemed to belong as they move around and even as they cross uh, borders. Third, borders do not simply enable the exclusion of non-citizens and migrants and the inclusion of citizens and guests. Their porosity and imperfection is part of their functionality and design. It enables a form of differential inclusion and selection that does not just block irregular migration, but filters it. And that's of crucial importance for the labor markets in advanced capitalist economies, especially in North America and Europe, as entire sectors um, in uh, um, you know, agriculture, care work, construction wouldn't function at all without uh, illegalized migrant labor. Fourth, and now turning from borders to migration, beyond the determin determinism of presumably objective push and pull factors that are studied by mainstream uh, scholars of migration, Migrants always exercise a relative and constrained freedom in deciding whether, where, and in which ways to migrate, thus claiming and performatively enacting a right to international freedom of movement or a right to escape that problematizes the international border regime as a whole and its ideological underpinnings, whether it is intended as such a problematization or not. Fifth, against the objectification of migrants and migration in dominant modes of knowledge production, the singularity and individuality of each act of migration has methodological and symbolic implications in terms of taking into account the specific experiences, uh, hopes and aims of the agents and how these inform and shape their practice as well as the kind of knowledge they produce. Sixth, uh, although migration is never completely independent from so-called objective social, economic and political structures and conditions, 
It is also not determined by them and exceeds any attempt to regulate, govern, or control it by state and transnational actors, thus exemplifying a practice or an art of moving across borders, as well as constituting a movement in the thick sense of the term that is irreducibly social and political. Insofar as epistemic resistance can be understood as the, as the use of our epistemic resources and abilities to undermine and change oppressive normative structures and the complacent cognitive effective functioning that sustains those structures, as Medina puts it, the emancipatory knowledge created in practice of migration qualifies as resistant. Migrants, just as other oppressed groups, are in a privileged position to produce such knowledge because, as a practical necessity, they need to navigate social space taking a multiplicity of perspectives into account, and they have an interest in developing such knowledge. To repeat, um, the claim is not that only or all migrants can produce such knowledge, so being a migrant is neither a necessary nor sufficient condition for develop developing that kind of critical perspective on the border regime that I have illustrated, but there is a non-contingent relation, uh, that's the claim, between certain practices and experiences in this case of migration and the likelihood that a certain critical perspective is developed. Um, so uh, in reverse, it's no accident, I would argue, that most philosophers working on migration have largely failed at taking this into uh, account. They, they, you know, it's not impossible, <laughs> and, and some of the obviously take these complex realities into account, but it's no accident that most of them uh, don't. As a result, the fact of migration and the border struggles that result from it open up new spaces for democratic innovations by urging us to ask, what would it mean to reorient political practice and theory around the alternatives and potentialities migration and border struggles open up? I come to the last section and uh, this will be rather brief, remaking the demos from below. In this final section, I will just very briefly outline how democracy and struggles for democratization, the practice of making and remaking the demos from below, could be re reinterpreted in light of migrant struggles. The knowledge produced in and through migrant epistemic resistance does not uniquely determine one type of critique of politics, but it opens up a space in which existing political options appear in a different light and new ones might emerge. Turning to migrant struggles allows us to find cues for an alternative way of undoing the demos and of remaking demoi um, from forms of political struggle that question established notions of the people and its boundaries, but might not end up embracing a positive vision of we the people in the singular. Migrant struggles highlight the fact that it is often precisely those who do not count as citizens or even as political agents women, workers, colonized subjects, migrants and refugees who develop new forms of citizenship and of democracy, democratic innovations from below and from the margins that promise to be more adequate to our current political consolation of this aggregated sovereignty traversed as it is by transnational power relations and struggles leading to complex processes of debordering and rebordering. At least those futures of democracy that go beyond statist imaginaries and regressive nationalist populist tendencies and thus qualify as futures at all will only come into view once uh, the challenge of migration and migrant political agency posed to dominant ways of thinking and practicing citizenship and democracy is taken seriously. Indeed, both migrant and indigenous struggles um, and the relation between these is not obvious, so I'll only hint at it and happy to go into more detail in the discussion. They question rather than instantiate the logic of hegemonic claim making that is still so often associated with revolutionary and radically transformative political projects. In the settler colonial context, such as North America, um, uh, settler um, struggles for self-determination by indigenous and occupied uh, people and peoples clash with the state's claim to exclusive territorial sovereignty and the underlying imaginary of popular sovereignty. The radically democratic potential of indigenous struggles today can be seen precisely in the dual displacement of hegemony, which can no longer serve as the privileged logic of political articulation and of the modern state, which can no longer serve as the unquestioned terrain for democratic struggle. As a result, indigenous struggles for self-determination and against the colonial and imperial project of the modern nation state to impose homogeneity and uniformity 
escaped both the framework of protest and that of dominant notions of civility, even if they might appear as constituent powers and civic powers in the plural. Similarly, in a world in which nation states claim a unilateral right to control their borders, both the borders of the territory and the borders of membership and belonging, migrant refugee movements challenge a whole way of life and the political imaginary that entirely abstracts from its own structural implication in the production of conditions that violate migrants' right to stay as well as their right to escape. The we and we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us, and we are here because you were or you are there is not and does not necessarily aspire to be the same as the we in we the people. So not all political and social struggles of our age can equally well or at all be articulated in the language of popular sovereignty, of sovereignty and of the people in the singular. Migrant as well as indigenous struggles thus enable us to see the collective enactment of denied freedoms, the temporary realization of utopian possibilities in the here and now, and the practical decentering of the state for what they are, openings of the political space that reveal what I think is a revolutionary potential. Radical democracy in a non-hegemonic key would thus start from the margins of the demos, from the refugees, the migrants, the exiles, and those who come after them, from those whom Judith Butler calls the discounted, the ineligible, the stateless, the occupied, and the disenfranchised, confounding the distinction between inside and outside and questioning established notions of people, uh, of the people and its boundaries without ending up embracing a positive vision of we the people. This political logic of migrant activism points us to forms of the civil bond that go beyond the bounded political community of statist imaginaries, both temporally and spatially. Migrants, activists, and migrant activists appeal to a bond that goes beyond the narrowly civil, legally institutionalized, and ideologically dominant bond that exists between citizens of the same polity. The bond their struggles appeal to is civil in a much broader and counter-hegemonic sense, as it ties the fate of migrants and refugees together with that of the citizens of the wealthier states in ways that are historically deep and politically expansive, especially in the cases in which they are economically and politically entwined. What would a political theory look like and what would a democracy look like that started with the social and political practice of migration in all its complexity, one that would be based on migrants' experiences and practices and their own capacities to reveal and establish civil bonds as expressed in their own struggles. Maybe a good starting point is to return to the words of Majd that I cited in the introduction. Stand up, my people. We all stand up. Go work. Thank you, and muchas gracias, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Selicates. Muchas gracias, Professor Selicates. Procederé entonces a presentar a la Profesora Regina Kraide, quien está a cargo de la siguiente exposición. Um, so Regina Kraide is Professor of Political Philosophy and History of Ideas at the Justus Liebig University in Gießen and co-founder of the Journal of Human Rights. Among her important publications are the Habermas Handbook, published in 2017 and co-edited with Christina Lafond and Hauke Bronkhorst, as well as Global Justice, which will be published in German in 2022. Um, procedo para presentar a la profesora Regina Kraide, quien es, bueno, profesora de filosofía política e historia de las ideas en la Universidad Justus Liebig, en Gießen y cofundadora de la revista de derechos humanos Zeitschrift für Menschenrechte. Entre sus publicaciones importantes están eh, el Handbook Habermas, publicado en el 2017, coeditado con Cristina Lafont y Hauke Brunhorst, así como Justicia Global, libro que será publicado en alemán en el 2022. En la ponencia que vamos a escuchar a continuación se titula No hay vida recta en la vida falsa. Una relectura de Adorno. Um, Professor Kreide, whenever you're ready, I'll share my screen. Um, buenos días. Um, first of all, I have to say it's uh, it is really very nice to participate here uh, once again in a wonderful conference in Lima, and I'm uh, also a very honored honored to 
uh, indeed be here again. Thank you uh, very much to Dr. Casuso. Uh, so thank you, Gianfranco, and thank you to all the other organizers uh, for this fantastic opportunity to share some ideas about critical theory in our world um, falling apart. At least uh, that's um, how I feel it. Um, today, I would like to um, share some, some thoughts with you um, in which I would like to reinterpret Adorno's famous sentence, there is no right life in the wrong one. And uh, yeah, thank you for this uh, Spanish uh, uh, translation. Uh, one tries to get it right, and yet one does many things wrong. Most of the time, one does not even know what is it, uh, what is uh, when I'm doing something wrong or right. Do I have to separate the garbage? Am I still allowed to drive a car or only e-cars? If I fly within Europe, is that wrong? Is it right to buy only sustainably produced clothes? To eat tofu? But surely is it right to donate to the global poor? Or is it better to give something locally to the homeless? But what good is it to separate garbage when the oceans are full of plastic? How environmentally friendly are e-cars if the batteries are an enormous source of pollution? Why shouldn't I fly as long there is no better developed rail network and eat awful tasting tofu when so beans cultivation destroyed the rainforest anyway? And why shall I humiliate people through donations? There is no right life in the wrong one. It's perhaps Theodore Adorno's most popular quote. The closing sentence of the 18th aphorism in Minima Moralio, Adorno's famous book of 153 aphorisms and essays in all. It was written in American exile in the late 1940s and was first published by a German publisher in 1951. You all know that, it's just you know, to recall it. <laughs> Minima Moralia, The Little Ethics, alludes to the Magna Moralia, The Great Ethics, a work probably written by Aristotle. The short pointed pieces remind us that it is the small everyday things and actions that we like or that bother us, that we want to say are right or wrong. There is no right life in the wrong one is probably so prominent because it briefly brings directly to our attention that the small things we judge and decide upon is permeated by the big picture, the whole wrong, the, structure, the structures, systemic connections, more or less favorable circumstances. And all the little things we suspect do not take place separated from social frameworks. With the innocent purchase of a t-shirt at a large clothing chain, we are confronted, if we inform ourselves just a little, with a whole chain of global social effects, low wages in the harvesting of cotton and production, environmental pollution in the dyeing of fabric and transportation, short life of the product due to the poor quality and so on. Even in the smallest things, all the suffering is hidden. But is that what Adorno wants to say? And is there really, even today, no right life? Let's take a closer look. Shall I wait? I'm sorry, I almost have it. I just wait. I just wait. I come now to one, the small, the everyday in the big context. 
Exactly. Lo pequeño. Yeah, exactly. We are there. So the 18th aphorism with the famous sentence is titled Asylum for the Homeless. And interestingly, it begins with the possibility of housing. Right at the beginning, important points are made. I quote, how private life is today is indicated by its setting. Actually, one can no longer live at all. The traditional apartments in which we have grown up have taken on something intolerable. Every trade of comfort in them is paid for with betrayal of knowledge. Every trace of security with the musty community of interest of the family." End of quote. Adorno clearly opposes the supposed coziness of aluminum plush residential quarters and likewise the naturalistic anti-urban Heideggerian Black Forest hut. For him, both stand for an unculture that stands in opposition to an aesthetically authentic life. But further, quote, the Neo-Saxons ones that have made tabula rasa at cases made by experts for Philistines or factory sites that have strayed into the sphere of consumption without any relation to the inhabitant, end of quote. Adorno does not say it exactly, but it's clear that he equally considers the ideas of building and living of a Le Corbusier to be an unacceptable spawn of technocratic instrumental reason. The functionalist architectural reform against any kind of ornamentation has taken on a life of its own as an aesthetic form. Ernst Bloch polemicized still a few, few years earlier that the pair of birth tongs must be sweetly, but a pair of sugar tongs must not. And Bloch goes on to describe that the transparent architecture of modernity in which no one could hide anymore was a glass training camp for the National Socialist Surveillance Dictatorship. For Adorno too, this assumption is certainly not entirely wrong, but he goes one step further and describes his criticism of a functionalist architecture and way of life in a more differentiated way. Functionalism does not work. The avant-garde utopia of a highly efficient, stylistical, unadorned, but authentic way of life as its predominant in modernity has failed for him all along the line. For it is only superficially about existential decisions on how one wants to live. The possibility of subjective, creative expression is replaced by mere function. Thus, a human potential is assumed that appears progressive and yet it's stifled right into its interior by the impotently held human beings. Architecture here and now, as Adorno sees it, contradicts usual, the actual need as soon as it deserves need. This critique of functionalism, however, is only one side. But there is an equally recurring figure of thoughts that runs through Adorno's work and which reveals the whole paradox of modernity. And that, in my view, is the following. Functionalism in architecture and elsewhere is itself indifferent to an aesthetic design of life at all and incapable of looking at and designing anything passionately. The reason for this and we'll come back to this, is that architecture, but not only architecture, clings to the ideal of private property and design aesthetically autonomous criteria that know only individual property and not collective practice and living in social spaces. Formulated in this way, it is already clear that Adorno is not concerned with a culturally conservative argument such that modernity has nothing to offer aesthetically and leads directly to fascism through instrumental application of reason. 
rather Adorno's keyword is that there is an indifference to embracing an aesthetic, aesthetic approach of life along the line of, oh, never mind if I separate garbage, still drive a car, fly short distances and buy sustainably, it can't be changed anyway. There is no right or wrong. But then can we better just sit back, make ourselves comfortable in our nicely decorated apartments and perhaps donate to soothe our conscience? Well, two, false interpretations. Of course, Adorno does not make it quite so easy for himself. And cynicism is absolutely far from his mind. The theme, there is no right life in the wrong one, runs like a red thread through other parts of his work as well. He has also transferred those aberratic insights about the aesthetic contradiction that arise in living into considerations of ethics. And that's what we are uh, looking at now. He begins his Frankfurt lectures from the summer semester of 1963 by pointing out that someone who has written a book about the right or rather the wrong life, he means his minima moralia, is surely expected to say something about the right life now in his lecture. In the end, he is quick to dampen any possible hope students might have. He will not give anything like direct instruction of the right life. That sounds sobering and perhaps you too are now a little disappointed. No great ethics that beautifully paints what constitutes right action like a blueprint, but not nothing either. Let us therefore pursue the famous sentence a little further. Perhaps you too had always understood it in such a way that Adorno wants to say with his famous sentence that there can be no morality in capitalism. That's a, a kind of usual interpretation. And because there is no morality in capitalism, thus also no right life. Why not? to morality belongs, so then the argument that people are free to exercise their actions or to refrain from actions. Without the assumption of freedom, we cannot be held responsible for our actions. Capitalism, however, has an iron grip on our lives and the constraints of growth, profit and consumption prevent true freedom of action. Trapped as we are in the profit economy, we can only do everything wrong. But even this reading of Adorno may not be quite convincing in its totality. For what is downright fatal about this interpretation, and at least I think this, does not apply to Adorno at all. And that's the aforementioned social constraints are presented as virtually given as inescapable face, as if there was no outside of capitalism. This may surprise you, but from Adorno's point of view, that would only be half the truth. For this interpretation of totality completely overlooks the fact that capitalism is indeed a well-rehearsed context of utilization. But Adorno's point here, I think, is precisely to show this, namely the assumption that there is no escape is what is called a context of delusion. It only seems as if there is an inescapable nature of capitalism, as if nothing can be changed, as if capitalism satisfies all need. And this exactly is this context of delusion. You know? As if we were not free at all. Both interpretations just presented miss as also Thilo Vischer shows in his Ardorno book, the interesting ambiguity of the famous sentence, for the wrong life does indeed exclude the right one, but it presupposes a conception of the right at the same time. That which is false is only false in relation to the true, 
At dawn, it becomes clear when one reads the lectures on moral philosophy and also dialectic of enlightenment, very well has an idea of the right life could be. And so the question is not so much whether there is a life at all, a right life at all, but rather how one can distinguish a right from a wrong one. We will now explore this question before returning to the problem of what exactly this means for our right life today. Three pathologies. Adorno approaches the question of how one actually determines the wrong from the right life in a way that may at first seem surprising. He starts as much as he already become clear from the wrong life. That is, from everyday life with all its transgressions as we have to live it today. Everything positive can only be determined from the negative. This sounds abstract, but it's not. Experienced injustice, and in a way this nicely fits also to what Robin has presented uh, uh, here, Experienced injustice, such as suffering, alienation, and other forms of damaged life, are identified by Adorno as the negative. This includes the violation of legitimate claims to protect, uh, to protection, freedom from arbitrariness, fair legal procedure, but also to housing, clean environment, etc. On the other hand, however, the negative also includes the courses of experiences of injustice and thus the focus on the question of why these claims were violated, although they are worth protecting. Adorno refers to these courses of norm violation with a psychological medical term as pathologies of reason. To low wages, undignified working conditions, consumer deception. One could add the emotional exploitation of poorly paid domestic help, child and elderly care by underpaid people who had to leave their own families behind, leave their own families behind in their country of origin, as well as early illnesses caused by environmental toxins and all forms of burnout as the result of precarious employment. But beyond that moral critique, Adorno sees a more fundamental problem created by the deregulation of markets and unrestricted growth that generates pathologies. Profit-seeking has taken on a life of its own as the consequence of an unlashed logic of exploitation. This leads to the fact that goods such such as human genomes, seeds, and also drinking water, as well as animals. That any kind of services, education, transport, health, but also needs, uh, human proximity, recreation, healthy food, increasingly come under the pressure of their exploitability. All these goods and services still serve solely a means for the pursuit of profit and through the use of instrumental reason, they are given a single purpose to assign them an exchange value to transform them into an individual form of property and to make profit with them. Certainly one can ask whether it might not be a roundabout way to first resort to an extensive description of social pathology in order to determine the right life. But no, I think it is the quickest route. For it is the pathologies described and many others that prevent reason. That is the capacity to orient oneself to what is right and true from prevailing. Fourth, freedom and the right life. We have almost reached the end of my presentation. However, one element is still missing here. Why, you may have asked yourself, can we want to lead a right life in a managed, a damaged life? 
And the answer is because there is freedom. Freedom is a claim of everyone that is absolutely worth protecting and on which all further claims are based. Adorno possibly following Marx sketched an image in the Minima Moralia that represents freedom. Quote, doing nothing like a wild animal lying on the water and looking peacefully at the sky, being nothing else without all further determination and fulfillment, end of quote. Freedom manifests itself in being able to pursue life goals that precisely do not serve self-preservation, that serve only work, health preservation. The only source of freedom is realized in a society emancipated from utility. More than that, a proper life is one when we are free from the need to have any striving for fulfillment at all. In other words, a life that's not marked by career planning from an early age that knows neither diets, cosmetic surgery, no other forms of self-optimization. And you guessed it, what it meant by this is a life in which the inevitable social pathologies inherent in a capitalist society do not prevent people from being free from precisely this striving to always have to do something, to conform, to integrate, to evaluate, to optimize, to improve. I know it's easy to say, but, uh, and hardly to do, but no. In order to come close to this stage, which is of course a utopia and can never be achieved, one must not be indifferent. An enormously important theme in Adorno, indifference, can manifest itself in denying people their status as persons by torture, killing, Marx's uh, mass extermination, uh, leaving them at borders as we have just heard. And not even perceiving this violation of entitlements as the violation. Or indifference is produced by invisibility of violations, also by a lack of relationship, a non-behavior in any turning away in the faces of obvious injustice. In our world, where we are medially confronted with brutalities near and far from us, indifference seems omnipresent towards people in Afghanistan, as well as towards refugees, homeless people at our doorstep, environmental destruction. Fifth, in the end, a question of the right politics. I think, I hope we have come a good deal closer to the question of how to distinguish a wrong from a right life. From a social point of view, capitalism gives birth to social pathology that generate indifference to injustice and ignorance about one's situation, which stand in the way of the possibility of living a self-determined good life. The wrong life, as I said at the beginning, does indeed exclude a right life. But this says nothing other than that capitalism generates a collective indifference in the face of the logic of exploitation. Lulled by consumption and individual property relations, we subsume to the beautiful pretense that our needs can best be met in capitalist relations and that there is no right life in the wrong one. Well, on the one hand, and yet it is one there on the other hand, as long as the normatively right collective practice of living on the water and looking peacefully at the sky is blocked, there remains saying no, and it is not always possible to say no. But if we do participate, we should do it with a due distance from the world and not let our conscience wither away completely and not to be sluggish to use one's moral judgment and become indifferent to moral wrong. The question of right living, Adorno concludes his lecture on problem 
in on problems of moral philosophy is the question of right politics. The utopian anticipations of right actions are the standard of political practice and should be. What good is it to separate garbage when all the oceans are full of plastic? First, it's right to ask this question and the other questions over and over again, prevent the indifference. Second, we need to expose the structure that produce the trash stand in the way of environmental friendly energy play into the hands of profiteers of cheap meat substitutes and perpetuate unjust legal systems that create poverty. And finally, one can say no with distance to individualized societies and its human coldness. There is a right life in the wrong one. One can actually, and one has to imagine it. Thank you for your patience and I'm very much looking uh, forward uh, to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kreide. Muchas gracias, Professor Kreide. So, and now we will proceed to the commentator section. And I would give the word to Maverick Diaz, who will be in charge of the commentaries uh, for 10 minutes. Procederemos entonces a la sección de los comentarios. Eh, y le doy la palabra a Maverick, que tiene 10 minutos para formular sus preguntas. Buen día. Muchas gracias, profesor Robin y profesora Regina, por sus maravillosas presentaciones. A continuación voy a eh, leer mis comentarios en castellano y seguramente Rodrigo eh, proyectará los comentarios en inglés traducidos. Empezaré eh, al revés, o sea, con la ponencia o la presentación de la profesora Kreide. Eh, empiezo entonces eh, y, eh, eh, leyendo. Frente a una interpretación nietzscheana, la moral sería ideología, y a una muy fatalista, no hay moral en el capitalismo que nos priva de libertad, sobre la vida justa o moral, en el texto expuesto eh, se rescata la ambigüedad de la fórmula no hay vida recta en la falsa, o no hay vida correcta en la falsa, según la cual la vida falsa no solo excluye, sino que al mismo tiempo presupone, como una afirmación de la negación, la vida justa. En esta comprensión ambigua de la tesis de Adorno, se subraya una referencia negativa a la vida justa que nos termina vinculando con ella. También se defiende que la realización de la vida correcta y de la razón tiene que atravesar necesariamente la vida falsa y su irracionalidad, las patologías sociales. De esta manera, la consideración en primer plano de la ambigüedad de la tesis de Adorno la afirmación de que la vida errónea presupone su relación con la vida correcta y de que la razón solo puede realizarse eh, mediante un recorrido crítico de aquello que le es negativo y contrario, sugieren una interpretación hegeliana de la fórmula. Sin caer, por supuesto, en los compromisos metafísicos de Hegel de largo alcance, esa sería mi pregunta, ¿no?, ¿Le resulta válida esta conexión de su interpretación de la tesis de Adorno con el método dialéctico de tipo hegeliano? Si ese es el caso, ¿cuáles serían las diferencias metodológicas que a su parecer se encuentran entre ambos enfoques acerca de la idea de que lo positivo solo puede producirse como resultado de haber recorrido lo negativo? Eh, prosigo. Eh, tanto al inicio del texto como al final aparece la referencia a la indiferencia. Frente a la injusticia, la explotación y la ignorancia misma sobre la propia situación. En cierto sentido, eh, parece como si el peso central en la aproximación a la moral de Adorno se encontrase en la consideración de la indiferencia como un obstáculo fundamental para la vida justa y en la necesidad de estar un poco por encima o más allá de esta. En esa línea, tal condición limitativa, aparentemente epistémica, parece situarse en un orden superior de ignorancia o de injusticia, en el sentido de que su funcionamiento impediría el mismo juicio moral. 
es decir, la posibilidad de considerar críticamente las patologías sociales, eh, la manera negativa mediante la cual operaría la razón en el mundo falso del capitalismo. De esta manera, se me ocurre preguntar cómo se podría posicionar esta consideración de la indiferencia de adorno en relación con otras formas de obstaculización de orden superior en cuanto a bloqueos epistémicos de acceso a la comprensión de las relaciones de dominación, como en general el concepto de ideología de segundo orden de celicates, o en específico la comprensión hegemónica del régimen fronterizo o el concepto de eh, eh, problemas de segundo orden de Rachel Yegi. ¿no? Es clara la referencia al origen causal de la indiferencia. Las estructuras, estructuras capitalistas, en cuanto que fomentan una consideración meramente instrumental de la actividad humana, la monetizan, la individualizan y la orientan solo al beneficio, y reproducen así una falta de vinculación humana con los otros, con el mundo y con uno mismo. Pero con respecto a la desactivación de esta indiferencia, no obstante, parece remarcarse en la exposición el ejercicio fundamental de la libertad como decisión para autoimponernos ciertos imperativos. Por ejemplo, no debemos ser perezosos para enjuiciar críticamente las cosas, no debemos ser indiferentes, debemos decir no o participar, pero con distancia. ¿Cómo se sitúa este ejercicio de autodeterminación con respecto al funcionamiento de las estructuras capitalistas? A pesar de que éstas generan indiferencia, parece que ellas mismas contendrían las condiciones de su superación, en cuanto que también producen a los sujetados a experimentar padecimientos, disonancias, contradicciones eh, inmanentes, cuya indiferencia es un lujo que aquellos no podrían permitirse, y que implica el surgimiento eventualmente de una agencia crítica. O como el texto sugiere, tales estru estructuras, a pesar de que parecen ser ineludibles, tienen que dejar de todos modos un margen para la libertad y para la posibilidad de proyectarse un excedente normativo. En todo caso, desde su lectura de adorno, la libertad para la crítica eh, y, de la y para la incorporación de mandatos morales contra la indiferencia resulta del mismo marco de las estructuras capitalistas o, o a pesar de, de este. ¿no? Ahora eh, continúo con la presentación del profesor Celicates. Eh, leo también los comentarios. La premisa central de la teoría del punto eh, de vista o de la posicionalidad, de la posición, Sostiene que los oprimidos socialmente y marginalizados epistémicamente tendrían el privilegio epistémico de poder comprender más adecuadamente las relaciones de dominio a las cuales se encuentran sometidos. Son objetadas las críticas de que esta conexión entre posición social e ilustración epistémica es automática porque es más bien un logro esforzado y de que el sostenimiento del privilegio epistémico en la posicionalidad implica arbitrariedad y particularidad, porque tales posiciones requieren substanciación histórica y sociológica, y porque son apoyadas también por estructuras subalternas. En relación con las estructuras sociales que reproducen el dominio, se entiende que tal ventaja especial que resultan tener los sujetos oprimidos para comprender mejor la situación crítica es en realidad el resultado de un esfuerzo, perdón, de un efecto estructural en la posición social ocupada por ellos, de acuerdo con el cual los sujetos oprimidos son forzados a comprender mejor cómo funcionan tales estructuras para poder navegarlas con un interés práctico y para poder superarlas con un interés emancipatorio. ¿Por qué llamar a esta situación y al fin, al fin y al cabo privilegio? Asimismo, ¿de qué manera se distinguen en relación con los fines de la crítica aquellos dos niveles de necesidad implicados en el privilegio epistémico, ¿no? el interés práctico y el interés emancipatorio, o la necesidad práctica y el interés emancipatorio? Eh, Continúo. En la ponencia se sostiene, 
que la incorporación por parte de la teoría crítica de los recursos epistémicos, de las luchas políticas, de aquellos que están sujetos a opresión, comprendidas como resistencias epistémicas, tendría el doble beneficio para la teoría crítica de, por un lado, anclarla a la realidad social y, por otro, de contrapesar o contrarrestar la tendencia en aquella a desconocer un contenido epistémico valioso en tales movimientos y de reproducir en el nivel teórico la desigualdad y el dominio que en principio buscan superar en términos prácticos. Me queda aquí la consulta acerca de los planteamientos históricos y o contemporáneos de los nombres particulares de las teorías críticas a los cuales apunta aquí la constatación de la eh, o la crítica de la ideología de la crítica. ¿no? Sería maravilloso si pudiese desarrollar brevemente esta referencia. Y finalmente me parece, la marcha de la esperanza ilustra paradigmáticamente un caso de resistencia epistémica que determina los movimientos de migrantes y de refugiados. En aquella se realizó una crítica inmanente y radical del régimen fronterizo que produjo conocimiento emancipatorio acerca de su funcionamiento. Antes que un régimen que funciona adecuadamente, se trata de una estructura cuya normalidad es la crisis constante. En esa línea, también se encuentran en las luchas políticas de los migrantes una práctica y un conocimiento sobre la democracia y la ciudadanía que van más allá críticamente de la comprensión establecida de tales realidades bajo los límites del Estado-Nación, de la soberanía popular, del nacionalismo de izquierda, sin necesidad de caer en la afirmación de un nosotros excluyente y homogéneo. Esta nueva forma de democracia remite a un vínculo civil de más largo alcance que conecta el destino de migrantes y ciudadanos de estados ricos, en el mismo proceso cooperativo de criticar los obstáculos que los separan, como el régimen fronterizo. En ese sentido, el lazo en que se sostiene la futura democracia tiene un nombre conocido, la solidaridad, aunque transnacional. ¿Por qué asumir necesariamente que tal vínculo cumple con las condiciones de una forma solidaria de vida, de un destino común que enlaza a los migrantes y ciudadanos, y no es más bien otra forma de vinculación parecida como altruismo, caridad, mera estrategia o una superposición de algunas de estas relaciones? En todo caso, además del destino compartido y las prácticas de cooperación, ¿Qué otras determinaciones conceptuales distinguen su concepción de esta forma de solidaridad democrática no hegemónica? ¿Cuáles serían las comunidades o divergencias de su aproximación a tal experiencia con respecto a la definición compleja brindada por la profesora Yegui el día de ayer? Muchísimas gracias por el espacio y el tiempo y les agradezco de antemano por sus respuestas. Muchas gracias, Maverick, por las preguntas y comentarios. Thank you very much, Maverick, for the questions and commentaries. Um, I will then um, allow Regina Kreide to, ask, to answer first because she was the first one who, who was asked the questions. Um, daría la palabra entonces a la profesora Regina Kreide para que aborde las preguntas presentadas primero. Thank you very much, Maverick, uh, for this uh... Um, very, very good and uh, to be honest, a bit hard to answer question, even though I had a, a bit of time uh, during your, your red <laughs> Robin's uh, 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 crit critical points. Um, well, uh, first of all, I have to say what I was interested in when reading Adorno's famous uh, paragraph anew was that I I got the, um, oh, first of all, I have to say it was because uh, it, I feel living in a pandemic time worldwide that the question, what is actually a good life uh, nowadays yeah, in pandemic times, in times of, um, of worldwide uh, the brutal capitalism, uh, ecological, uh, problems, uh, the, the climate change and the extinction of, of different species and so on. Um, like I said at the beginning, this idea of 
our world is falling apart, uh, put us very much under pressure thinking about what really does it mean to live a good life? Is it, is it possible? And then uh, secondly, uh, one of the major interpretations uh, you could do is read is um, not not with uh, um, uh, Rahel Yegi and Robin Salikatis, but what you can always read is that well, uh, Kabe, one understands the paragraph of Adon in the sense that he says, well, there is no outside of capitalism. Uh, we are trapped in uh, the brutality of capitalism. It uh, has an iron grip on our uh, lives. And um, since living in profit uh, economy, we can only do everything wrong. And since, uh, and I think uh, this uh, is not a right interpretation. Why? Because um, that's exactly, in my view, what Adorno called a context of delusion. And second, uh, it under uh, oversees that freedom is such an important aspect uh, in Adorno's and also in Horkheimer's uh, approach. Uh, and, and third, as it does not give enough room for the ambivalence uh, that the whole phrase uh, puts here on the table in the sense of there is no good life in the false one. So what is the relationship between one and the other? Uh, a further point I would like to stress here is, and that that's your uh, the, the first question you raised. Um, well, then if we would like to know what exactly means to live a good life, even so in a world falling apart, uh, then we start with what you know, we all learned in a way by Horkheimer and Adorno with the negative. And in a way, yes, it's a Hegelian reading, but also I thought it's a, a in a way, a critical theory reading offered by Adorno and Horkheimer themselves, saying that uh, from uh, analyzing and looking at the at the negative, in the sense of uh, also what uh, Robin described today, it's the the feelings of uh, being exploited, uh, of um, alienated, where um, uh, uh, Rahel Yegi extensively has written uh, about as well, of destruction, of uh, being discriminated and so on, um, is in a way a privileged uh, access to how we live right now. But we cannot stop here. And that would be also my question to Robin. We cannot stop here at this epistemic uh, privileged access. But, and now I think Adorno and also Hegel may come in, it's a question of how to, how to judge, uh, how, to, how to justify uh, this access and what does, what does course out of that. And indifference, again, is also such a privileged access. And now out of this then, uh, we can learn by reflecting on our situation and giving further reasons why uh, we have here um, uh, different pathologies at stake, we can come up with an interpretation of what might possibly, uh, what might be a possibility to overcome the situation. And um, for that, and that's also um, often overseen, the moral judgment plays in Adorno an important role, even though, like he said to his students, he never would like to offer a full-fledged uh, ethics. Uh, is this a, a higher order, so very good, uh, I think, a higher order um, level of ignorance or injustice? Um, I, I think you are right. I, and I took your, your question that you want to say, well, we do need that. And I think, yes, it's, it's, it's true that it's, one has to start somewhere. So um, 
And I, I think that I don't want to say this. It's a the uh, we need freedom is that higher order assumption that he offers, where one cannot fall back and go back behind. Uh, and from that uh, self determination, uh, moral judgments um, are are possible. And. Uh, I think this is exactly what you called also uh, very nicely the uh, um, ambiguity of uh, the phrase. Um, there is no uh, right one in the life in, in the false life. Second, um, about oh that was already the the second argument. Yeah, exactly. And the third one um that and what i've said just that lead uh, leads me to the third aspect self-determination uh within uh capitalism um yeah i may have answered that already in the sense that i think uh, there is no uh, totality of uh, capitalism that blocks or any kind of freedom and uh tries to dealing with the uh, situation. This exactly is the delusion that we cannot reflect even under most uh, harsh conditions on our situation uh, and think about how to overcome these. So self-determination is, if you so want, uh, part of the assume the freedom that's uh, assumed where one cannot go uh, behind, you know. And so in that way, I would say, um, yes, there is a kind of epistemic prior access uh, to uh, very special uh, experiences of determination, of uh, exploitation and so on. Um, however, there again, uh, I would say there is this other side of being suppressed, and this is the uh, the idea of freedom and uh, self determination, uh, in a way, a given uh, uh, in history found way uh, normative uh, conception, at least in my view. So thank you very much for this. I hope I answered uh, your question. I feel I have not, but um, maybe there is time to uh, continue with the discussion. Thank you very much um, for the answer. Because of the bilingual character of the event, I will try to translate and summarize it uh, shortly. I'm sorry. Sorry, I should have stopped in the minute, sorry. No um, and I apologize if I don't really get it all, but um, trataré de hacer un breve resumen de la respuesta de la profesora Kreide. En primer lugar, bueno, eh, enfatizó el hecho de que la pregunta que, que, que el texto de Adorno plantea acerca de qué es una vida correcta ha tomado particular importancia en estas épocas de pandemia, de crisis ambiental y de capitalismo arrasante, y que justamente en lo que se, a lo que se quiso oponer es esta interpretación común de Adorno de que no hay algo así como un afuera del capitalismo y por ende todo lo que hacemos está mal. ¿no? Ella sostiene entonces que esa interpretación no es correcta y que justamente pensar eso es lo que Adorno criticaba en términos de un contexto de delusión. Eh, porque justamente lo que ocurre ahí es que se pierde de vista la importancia que Adorno le concede a la libertad y al mismo tiempo no se deja espacio para esta ambivalencia o ambigüedad, ambigüedad propia de la frase de que no hay vida recta en la falsa, sobre todo en lo que respecta a la relación pues entonces entre la vida correcta y la vida falsa. Entonces, a propósito de la primera pregunta de Maverick acerca de la cuestión de lo negativo, eh, la profesora Craig insistía en que, claro, hay justamente... Eh, estas experiencias negativas nos permiten un acceso a la forma en la cual opera esta vida falsa, y es, es algo que Jorge Heimer y Adorno desarrollan a partir de Hegel para la teoría crítica, pero la pregunta sería entonces, ¿cómo justificar dicho acceso y qué puede resultar de él? Que, cómo, ¿Cómo superar justamente eh, esta vida falsa? Y esa es un poco la pregunta fuerte, digamos, de la teoría crítica. Eh, a partir de ello, eh, respecto a la segunda pregunta que tiene que ver con el problema de... Um, la falsedad consiste en una especie de segundo orden, eh, la, no, perdón, la, la, hay una especie como de capacidad crítica de segundo orden, esta sería para Adorno justamente la libertad como la capacidad que tenemos para autodeterminarnos y por ende para emitir 
juicios morales, y Adorno insistía mucho en sus lecciones de que lo, el juicio moral tiene un papel importante y que no hay algo así como recetas morales predeterminadas que se apliquen automáticamente. Y ya para cerrar, eh, justamente la idea de la posibilidad de autodeterminarnos en el seno de la forma de vida capitalista consiste en que no hay que concebir el capitalismo como una totalidad cerrada que bloquee totalmente a la libertad, sino que la libertad debe entenderse como esta otra cara de la opresión y que, que tiene un potencial crítico y un potencial emancipador que puede hacerse patente y que se, hace, se ha hecho patente, de hecho, en la historia. Ok, having said that, I would then give the word to Professor Selicata so that he can answer the questions posed by Maverick. Tras haber hecho la pequeña síntesis, le daría entonces la palabra al Profesor Selicata para que responda a las preguntas de Maverick. Gracias. Yeah, muchas gracias, Maverick, por las uh, preguntas. Uh, otra vez, muy buenas y muy difíciles. Um, entonces, voy a responder. Uh, hay que ser breve. Um, yeah, thanks so much for the great questions. Um, I'll just go through them and just give you some um, uh, elements of a response. Again, like Regina, I will, I will try to be brief, and uh, these complex questions would need much more uh, time to discuss, obviously. First, I think you're right that the notion of um, privilege is at least ambivalent um, because uh, it's it's partly a necessity, partly a necessity of survival even that gives rise to the kind of knowledge that I'm talking about. Um, but I still think that it might capture the ambivalence that is at stake here because it's not just a matter of uh, powerlessness or deprivation, it is, Um, also necessary to highlight the enlarged, um, let's say, sense of possibility and also the um, more adequate uh, grasp of the uh, situation that this kind of um, position um, allows. And I mean, this ambivalence, I think, comes out in, in a lot of the literature <clears throat> on uh, um, the epistemic dimensions of the standpoint of the oppressed or the marginalized. I mean, you, you can find this in, a, in many different shapes. I mean, you can even think of um, Georg Simmel's uh, article on the stranger, yeah, where he says the stranger is forced to be something like a lay sociologist because he's, you know, he, he enters a social context. Everybody acts um, you know, in ways that seem completely natural to them but it's hard to figure out how it works, but you need to figure it out if you don't want to be made into the stranger who doesn't belong um, uh, all the time. And in a, in a way, the experience of migration is just a, a kind of larger version of that uh, similar observation. Um, <clears throat> and also in uh, Du Bois, for example, it's very clear that the uh, what he calls the, the, the double consciousness Um, it's not, it's, I mean, he, he describes it in all its ambivalence, and he talks also about the kind of destructive effects of it and the self doubt and the loss of subjectivity, et cetera, that come with it. But yet, Du Bois makes clear that this is the basis for a more adequate understanding of the social world and that um, it articulates, that understanding articulates something that is very difficult to grasp from the hegemonic or the dominant standpoint. And so in this uh, particular um, respect, I think uh, that you know, talking of epistemic privilege here is, well, partly that's the language that has been uh, developed, but it's, um, you know, it, it tries to capture that as well. Um, but the ambivalence that you point out certainly uh, remains. Um, <clears throat> I also think it's a good point uh, to ask how the practical and the emancipatory are related. I mean, they don't uh, necessarily fall together or they are not necessarily connected in all uh, contexts, on all cases. Um, uh, so you could, for example, imagine a Simelian stranger who has the practical necessity to orient himself in Uh, a different, uh, let's say, cultural context, but who doesn't necessarily develop the same kind of emancipatory interest that I ascribed to oppressed groups. So um, the two sides, um, in a way, come together only in the case of uh, oppressed groups, where you have both the need to understand how power relations work, and you know, to take the example of 
uh, racism to know how to teach your children to walk on the street, to react when the police car um, uh, drives by, to how to comport yourself when you enter a shop to just go shopping or how to behave here when you're in school or in university. These are all things that um, members of dominant groups don't necessarily have to uh, spend any thought on, um, but which, uh, especially in the case of racism, uh, racially oppressed groups have to spend a lot of thought on, also a lot of education on and kind of uh, teach their children. And that's, that's the kind of knowledge that is forced by uh, the circumstances <clears throat> uh, and potentially, I think, um, it can be linked to this emancipatory interest as well, because um, that knowledge gives you not just the practical ability to uh, survive under the current conditions or to navigate um, a social space that is structured by rules that others have defined for you, um, but at least um, uh, potentially, I'm not saying that this is necessarily the case, uh, you know, potentially it can be articulated with the emancipatory interest that those groups necessarily in a way have even in situations where um, this might not seem a realistic option in transforming that social context. Um, so that's the link I have in mind here, but you're right that it doesn't, in all cases or in all circumstances, uh, need to be connected these two levels. So it's certainly good to distinguish them, <clears throat> at least analytically. Um, the second uh, point that you made uh, concerned uh, this dual significance of epistemic practices of the oppressed or of ordinary agents, as one could also say, for on the one hand anchoring critical theory in practice and thus <clears throat> let's say fulfilling this, um, uh, you know, sometimes one has the feeling this is a rhetorical commitment. So critical theorists always say that, but they rarely spend a lot of time in actually doing it, <laughs> you know, like, okay, surely we're all committed to critical theory being anchored in, you know, social practices, but let's just go on and theorize. <laughs> Um, so that's, you know, that's the one thing I think this uh, can uh, remind us of. And the other thing is, <clears throat> as you pointed out, that um, it can serve as a kind of counterweight to the misrecognition of the epistemic agency of the oppressed that is also often a feature of critical theory. Now, there are some, I think, quite obvious cases I mentioned very briefly in the talk, um, someone like Louis Althusser, who, you know, thinks that, um, ordinary agents are just so caught up in the ideologies and their everyday practices that they are constitutionally incapable of reflecting critically on that. And therefore you need what he calls this epistemic break with ordinary consciousness and you need science in the you know, true sense uh, to articulate an adequate perspective on the social world. Uh, you also find it in, you know, um, sociologists and theorists like Pierre Bourdieu and, and many others, but you do also, I think, find it in critical theory in the more uh, narrow sense. So, uh, you know, if you, if you just, um, I mean, you know, we, we, could, we could discuss all these examples, but I think it's, 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 in, it's interesting to see that even someone like uh, Honneth, whom I, uh, you know, quoted in his, uh, his article on emancipatory interests and the cognitive labor of the oppressed is, I think it's, it's a really interesting attempt to figure out how that works. But, you know, even he has a very strong tendency uh, to think of um, agents as at best having a kind of inchoate narrative grasp of what is going on. It really takes the theorist to come up with a proper you know, analytically precise and empirically adequate and theoretically sophisticated analysis. Um, and you, you see that even in his, in his um, <clears throat> I mean, maybe most clearly in his, in his more recent kind of institutional uh, turn, you know, in the book on socialism, but also in Freedom is Right. I mean, in the book on socialism, he even says, you know, let's just, let's just not um, pay that much, much attention to all these, uh, um, you know, resistant subjectivities and, and, and their practices. Let's just look at the institutional realizations of um, certain achievements, and those should be then the basis for um, the normative critique. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that that's not one possibility, but to emphasize those institutional ex achievements at the expense of the social struggles and what the agents have, you know, been pushing for seems to be I mean, that's just, you know, that, I mean, in a way, that's just too much Durkheim and Parsons and too little uh, critical theory, theory, I would say, because if you look at these institutional achievements, not only are they in most cases linked to 
social struggles and social movements that have pushed for them, you know, if you want to have any um, hope that they will be maintained or even expanded, again, this will require uh, these rebellious subjectivities and their practices that Honnett dismisses in uh, this kind of stark uh, contrast. Um, so there are quite a few examples I think one could point to, and it, it's it's also not surprising because uh, the ambivalence that this um, uh, let's say articulates is part of the very structure of critical theory. I mean, on the one hand, critical theory has this commitment to being grounded in practice, and as Honnett himself has often emphasized, it is precisely this commitment which distinguishes it from traditional or mainstream or normative or liberal theories. Right. I mean. If you want to hold on to the methodological um, specificity of critical theory as a research program, it has to involve that claim to be grounded in practice. So you cannot just give it up. But at the same time, critical theory only becomes necessary in a way once uh, what happens in practice, uh, once what the agents do, is itself constrained in structural ways by um, uh, you know, or constrained by structural obstacles, by by things that prevent agents from just developing, um, you know, the right kind of understanding of the social world, or uh, just organizing themselves in the in the kind of right or or um, justifiable ways. So it's and these things obviously stand in a kind of relation of tension uh, to each other. So I think the fact that critical theorists sometimes tend to one more often to the other side of that um, relation of tension is not surprising. That's why I think you need this constant um, foregrounding of the practices of the agents to prevent that tension to be dissolved too quickly and too quickly, you know, to, to prevent the critical theorists from too quickly moving on to the objectivist side or resolution of the tension and to think that well, since the agents are ideologically deluded, it's probably me, the critical theorist, who has to provide the right kind of analysis. Um, so, you know, very, very um, simply put, that's that's um, uh, what I would respond to the second uh, question. Uh, then, very briefly on the third point, um, yes, solidarity would indeed uh, be uh, one way to spell out what I uh, take this enlargement of the social bond. Uh, to amount to, it's uh, probably not a surprise because I work with Rahel in this in this project, and we've been discussing this a lot. Also, in the little book on social philosophy, we have a short uh, subchapter on solidarity where we, you know, spell out some of these um, uh, terminological um, proposals uh, that Rahel has uh, expanded on and developed much more systematically uh, yesterday. Um, I, I especially. Um, uh, you know, find myself and find very useful for this particular project on migration and migrant solidarity, if you want to call it that way, uh, this thought that uh, solidarity um, also uh, and essentially involves a shared social positioning vis-a-vis -vis, um, the kinds of associations and relations and bonds that already exist be it because of you know, historical relations, you know, sort of colonialism or imperialism, be it because of contemporary relations of economic exploitation or political uh, domination, um, or be it because of um, you know, social and cultural interconnections between people who are already here and who are already part of the societies we're talking about and their you know, extended and, and their extended social bonds, because um, you know, the, the, the main problem that I think both uh, Rahel and I um, write against is a version of solidarity that is uh, communitarian in the sense of presuming a certain we that is thought to be homogeneous, uh, unified, and that is then subjected to migration in a way as an external force, migration that causes heterogeneity, difference, disunity, fragmentation, and then we somehow have to put society back again because all these strangers came in and destroyed our nice little uh, society. Now that's a very, I mean, that's a fascistic fiction basically, right? And uh, I mean, it took, I mean, for, for, for that picture to even make remotely sense um, uh, in Germany, you know, I mean, that, that was only a possible fiction even after you know, the Nazis tried to realize it. So it's, I mean, all these fantasies of the homogeneous German people that is somehow 
from within and from without uh, under the force of uh, these foreign forces which try to um, disintegrate it um, I think really has to be rejected not just for the German case of course but you know in, in any case it's 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 the wrong way to think about social relations and about what social what solidarity could um, amount to uh, and the last point I want to say here maybe is that precisely as, as uh, Rahel has said, in order to avoid these homogenizing or communitarian notions of um, solidarity, uh, we would have to take these um, relations of tension that seem to be part of the very concept um, between particularism and universality, um, uh, between the given and the made, etc., to take them again as tensions that or constitutive tensions that need to be in a way negotiated in the practice of solidarity so solidarity once you know it's it's grounded in a notion of the we that is that is not itself at stake in solidarity or is not itself expanded through solidarity i think ceases to be solidarity you could call it a regressive solidarity um as rahel uh, calls it uh, i I think pseudo solidarity a term that was also used yesterday is an interesting concept in this uh, regard and that doesn't mean that you have you know just one criterion that allows you to distinguish true solidarity and pseudo solidarity but rather that um, you know pseudo solidarity um, uh, is the better term for forms of solidarity that, that just don't work with these tensions that think that they can uh, one-sidedly resolve them by just sticking with the particularity but also by just appealing to, you know, we're all humans. And that's also sort of solidarity in a sense. It's too easy. I mean, solidarity requires a very difficult work of solidarization that you cannot skip, that you cannot just, you know, pretend to or invoke um, without that without that work. Um, yeah, so, so thanks a lot. I mean, there would be a lot more <laughs> to say, especially about, you know, non-hegemonic forms of solidarity. There are different genealogies, I think, from... The more hegemonic solidarity that usually dominates the social discussion but um yeah i hope that there's still a bit of time for discussion so i just stop here and maybe respond to the question as Regina um posed later and try to make some connections with her paper but for the moment i think it's maybe better to open it up so thanks again thank you very much professor salicates for the answers um i will try to briefly summarize them in Spanish, um, but I would say that if people have already questions, they can begin to write them to me in the chat so that I afterwards can read them. Um, voy a tratar de hacer un pequeño resumen de la respuesta del profesor Silicates, pero quería decir desde ya que si alguien en el público tiene preguntas, pueden irlas escribiendo por el chat, mandándomelas a mí, y yo de ahí las voy a leer en el tiempo que nos quede. Entonces, eh, a propósito de las tres preguntas de Maverick, la primera que concierne al concepto de privilegio epistémico, eh, eh, Robin Salicates reconoce que es una noción profundamente ambivalente, porque por un lado responde, el desarrollo de privilegios epistémicos responde a ciertas necesidades de supervivencia de grupos marginalizados, pero por otro lado tiene este potencial de generar una producción de un conocimiento más profundo de cómo funciona nuestro sistema social y sus mecanismos de opresión. Entonces el punto es justamente pensar esta, esta, esta ambivalencia como una tensión productiva, y eso es un poco lo que ha hecho la eh, standpoint theory, pero que tiene también una, una, digamos, larga data en la tradición sociológica. ¿no? Se refirió, por ejemplo, a un eh, artículo o texto de Georg Simmel en torno a los extranjeros como sociólogos, como lay sociologists, como sociólogos que llegan a un lugar, a un contexto y empiezan a ver sin, digamos, el velo de la naturalidad cómo funciona la sociedad. Eh, y que la migración es justamente un fenómeno que, en cierto modo, generaliza este tipo de eh, situaciones. Eh, esta tensión de, propia del concepto de privilegio epistémico de los grupos marginalizados, excluidos o explotados, también está en la obra de Du Bois, con, eh, mediante el concepto de doble conciencia. ¿no? Acá también está la ambivalencia, por un lado, la doble conciencia propia de los grupos que están sujetos sistemáticamente al racismo, implica una pérdida de subjetividad, sufrimiento, etcétera, pero al mismo tiempo es la base o la posibilidad para articular una mejor comprensión del mundo social. Entonces, lo que sí es cierto eh, eh, es que es necesario distinguir entonces analíticamente entre por un lado la dimensión práctica y la dimensión o la posibilidad emancipatoria del de, eh, privilegio epistémico. No necesariamente ambas van de la mano. En el ejemplo de Simmel, el extranjero tiene una necesidad práctica de desarrollar una especie de comprensión de cómo funciona el mundo social 
ahí, pero que no tiene por qué tener un eh, interés emancipatorio. Pero sí es cierto que estas dos dimensiones, la necesidad práctica y el interés emancipatorio, suelen ir de la mano para los eh, grupos oprimidos, quien, quienes tienen esta necesidad de aprender cómo comportarse en el mundo social para poder sobrevivir, eh, y saben navegarlo pues, desde esta posición marginalizada, pero que esto justamente da la posibilidad de un interés emancipador. Pero no hay ninguna garantía, de todos modos. Ya, en segundo lugar, a propósito de la cuestión de la necesidad de anclar a la teoría crítica con la práctica, el profesor Silicates insistía en que este es un problema, digamos, clásico, autores como eh, Althusser, eh, Bourdieu, Durkheim, etcétera, propios de la sociología francesa, tienden a marginalizar, o, digamos, defender una visión muy negativa de los actores sociales como si no tuvieran capacidades críticas o reflexivas y que eso se manifiesta hasta cierto punto incluso en la obra de Axel Honneth y en su giro institucional eh, en obras como El derecho de la libertad o La idea del socialismo. Sin embargo, para la teoría crítica, esto es interesante, esta tensión es, es hasta cierto punto constitutiva porque por un lado la teoría crítica tiene un anclaje práctico, tiene que tener un anclaje práctico y eso es lo que distingue metodológicamente la teoría crítica de las teorías tradicionales o del liberalismo pero por otro lado como teoría crítica, tiene que implicar una crítica de aquellas obstrucciones estructurales que impiden a los agentes sociales desenvolverse, digamos, de manera correcta o deseable en la práctica. Eh, lo importante es, sin embargo, que esta tensión no se disuelva y que no caigamos en una especie de objetivismo que privilegie solamente las instituciones o los eh, eh, logros institucionales, como hasta cierto punto haría el Jonet Tardío, sino más bien enfatizar siempre la importancia de las luchas sociales como el motor que impulsa eh, el progreso moral, si se quiere, o los eh, logros institucionales propios de la sociedad, para tener siempre en cuenta esta tensión. Y para terminar, a propósito del concepto de solidaridad y esta idea de entender a la solidaridad como una ampliación del vínculo social, mucho del trabajo que Robin Selicates y Rachel Yeh están desarrollando es sobre todo para oponerse a una visión comunitarista, o comunitaria, perdón, eh, homogenizante, que presupone algo así como un nosotros dado, que ya se comparte y que recién después se enfrenta a, por ejemplo, movimientos de inmigrantes que hasta cierto punto alteran la vida social pacífica que ya teníamos. Eh, esa es una ficción fascista, fascista dice el profesor Selicates. Entonces, contra esta visión, lo que es importante y lo que es valioso del concepto de solidaridad, como bien la profesora Rachel Yegui mostró ayer, es que el, el concepto está atravesado por ciertas tensiones constitutivas, como por ejemplo, que al mismo tiempo está dada, pero está, está hecha, o que es universal, pero es particular, y justamente estas tensiones tienen que negociarse en la praxis y en la práctica social, porque si no, si se disuelve la tensión y se cae hacia uno de los dos polos, caeríamos o bien en pseudo solidaridades o en solidaridad regresiva. Ok, espero no haber tomado demasiado tiempo, eh, pasaría entonces ahora a las preguntas del público. I will then proceed to the questions of the public. There is a first question by Rurion Melo. Um, it's a question addressed to Professor Selicates. The question is, Robin, thanks for your text. I have a question. How do you see the different conditions that affect migrants' experiences? Since migrants may experience injustices in different ways, depending on their nationality, skin color, religion, language they speak, etc., it is possible to say that their different vulnerabilities have epistemic consequences, This difference can lead to different interests, needs, action strategies, and even create conflicts among migrants, migrants themselves. How plural should this perspective be? Um, that's the first question. This is una primera pregunta. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank, thanks a lot for the um, for the question, uh, Rurion. That's uh, that's a very important one, and I mean it. It it. Um, Uh, pertains to all uh, you know groups that uh, we can uh, think about in terms of standpoint theory. I mean, the same is obviously true for um, uh, you know if you if you take women as an oppressed group, if you think about a class uh, standpoint, if you think about racialized groups, they're all internally uh, plural and heterogeneous. They all are themselves um, you know traversed by uh, power asymmetries and marginalizations, etc. And um, so that's the first thing to note that you know these are these are not homogeneous or unified groups, and maybe this is particularly uh, particularly obvious in the case of my migrants because it's a very very broad category, and um, you know I don't want to overgeneralize um, uh, the claim. So um, what I what I would say though is that 
uh, the the case I've been talking about, so the which is a very specific one, obviously the the march um, of uh, the refugees um, from uh, Budapest to the border, but you could make similar claims for other you know migrant protests either um, during the act of migration at the border or also post migration. Most refugee activism takes place after uh, the borders are crossed. But in recent years, especially also at the border, this has also been true for the US-Mexican border, for example, that in these cases, um, there is uh, very often um, a kind of explicit uh, political claim making that exemplifies also the kind of, um, let's say, epistemic uh, standpoint that I've been uh, talking about. So. Um, there are still different interests, there are still different needs, different vulnerabilities, even in these situations. But uh, um, I think what also happens is that beyond, and maybe that's a case of migrant solidarity, beyond these differences, there is the construction of um, something like a common standpoint that doesn't deny these differences, as solidarity doesn't necessarily deny such differences, but still builds something common uh, out of them. And I think this is empirically, uh, you know, if, if you look at some work in critical migration uh, studies, including uh, the recent uh, book edited by Vicky Squire and others, uh, which is, I think, uh, uh, entitled Reclaiming Migration, where um, she, uh, where they, where they uh, let's say, document migrant voices about the so-called refugee crisis. And um, of course, there's it's a whole plurality of voices. There's not one uh, position, but there are certain you know themes. There are certain um, commonalities that emerge that all have to do with the what I call this expansion of the civil bond. They all point to you know colonial inheritances that are for many Europeans very far in the past, but that are very present for for those people who are in in a, in one way or the other forced uh, to flee. Uh, and um, and you know the. The decision to let's say go to the UK or to France or to Germany is not one that is completely arbitrary, but in many cases tracks these perceived and real uh, connections. So you know, for someone like David Miller to say, "Well, you know, I'm just sitting in my house, and then suddenly some random dude comes up and knocks at my door, and then I have to decide, well, do I let them in or not?" has very little to do with the actual historical situation where it's, um, you know, there are certain reasons and, and, and so on why, why people migrate and why they show up in the places in which, um, in which they show up. So that's, that's, that's the, let's say the easy case for my argument, I think, where this is made quite explicit by migrants themselves. And in the case of the marches, um, you know, it's, it's accompanied by explicit political claim making. Mm, then there are cases, I think, which are maybe a bit more difficult, where um, there, there's, there's some kind of, uh, you know, let's say, claim making or critical consciousness involved, but not necessarily in the terms in which I tried to articulate it. Then in those, and, and again, this, you know, this doesn't necessarily just um, uh, hold for migration itself, it holds for um, all critical practices, let's say. Um, and, and in these cases, I think you could say, well, if, um, if in a kind of you know, critical dialogue, uh, the subjects in question would, would, uh, would, would, would say, well, you know, that's actually, I haven't thought about it, but that's one way to articulate or to re-articulate or to translate um, our claims, then, you know, that's, I think, again, an interesting outcome. Uh, but then, of course, there is a, you know, probably the large majority of migrants and maybe also uh, refugees who, in a way, just want a better life for themselves, and they're not, you know, particularly interested in pursuing the the more fundamental political uh, form of critique that I've uh, talked about that gets articulated in the march, and it's entire and you know, I would never criticize, and that's entirely legitimate. There's nothing wrong with that, but even in these cases, I think there's a kind of objective, you know, independent from whatever intention or political consciousness they have, an objective. Um, critical force to this migration, which shows something about the border regime and which shows that something is fundamentally wrong about the border regime without even them having to make that argument. So, so you can ascribe a standpoint, I mean, so that's what I want to say, you know, in some point, in some cases, the standpoint is articulated very clearly and precisely those terms by the subjects in question. In some cases, the standpoint could emerge out of an interpretive encounter, let's say, between 
a more theoretical articulation and um, self-understanding of the subject. And at some point, the standpoint can be legitimately ascribed because of the, you know, let's say, objective significance or force of the practice that agents engage in with entirely different intentions. Um, so that's how, how I would try to respond to the to this very important question. But I think on all these levels, um, talk about the standpoint doesn't necessarily uh, Require and in fact, it shouldn't you know go hand in hand with denying these differences that you have rightly uh, pointed out. So I hope it's it's compatible um, to have the kind of recognition of plurality and heterogeneity and the ascription of a standpoint. Thank you very much for the answer. Um, I would ask the public if they still if there are any other questions to please send them in the chat so that I can read them. Um, muchas gracias por la respuesta y pidiéndose al público que si todavía hay alguna pregunta las manden por el chat para que yo pueda leerlas. Ok, since I don't see... Ah. Um, okay, so I would then give the word to um, either Professor Salicatus or Professor Kreide if they want to um, dwell a bit on the more like, or, or deepen on the commentaries that were um, or the questions that were posed by Maverick. Okay. Well, I mean, do you want to start, Regina? Or, uh, because I, I could. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, first of all, the question is how much time do we actually still have? 18 um, minutes, more or less. Ah, all right, okay. Well, yeah, thank you. I would like to, since there, I, I see that there is a, um, which is not surprising, uh, a link between Robin Celicatis and uh, my approach. I would like to raise here a, a, a question, which is also a question, uh, um, Maverick has uh, raised, and this is the one how we can um, judge on uh, experiences uh, being made. And uh, I was asking in my talk about uh, what is the, uh, how do we approach uh, the right life in a wrong life. Uh, and for that, I, I pointed out that we need to think about also experiences, the reflection of experiences. There's dealing with uh, the uh, starting as philosophers uh, with the negative, the an analysis of the negative, the uh, humiliation, the uh, domination, the discrimination. And that leads us then to the experiences and uh, uh, our question here, at least one common question, seems to be how to deal with these experiences. And what I'm, what strikes me, and I also have not addressed that uh, fully in my talk tonight. Um, what I'm, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in the morning of your, what uh, what uh, uh, interests me, and I think it is a problem. Um, of our approaches here, if I may say so, is that we need to say something about what are the the uh, the what the criteria to find out about uh, the what are the right uh, experiences we think are the ones of which we can rely on. Um, why am I interested? In this is the following. Um, we could say, well, um, uh, many people feel dominated, let's say, especially in our days in pandemic times. And they say, well, I'm dominated here. I, I'm not free anymore. I'm dominated here by uh, the government and the pressure the government puts on us uh, now, possibly introducing an obligation to get vaccinated. Uh, and I feel really dominated. Uh, um, I feel not respected anymore. Uh, second example, uh, right-wing uh, people, highly right-wing people, which is also a, a global problem. They say, uh, they argue that 
well, I'm, I'm discriminated. I'm, I cannot uh, stay in public my opinion. Um, uh, I, I also feel, I don't feel uh, dominated by capitalism. I, I in a way think uh, we should even over, we should uh, uh, have more, let's say privatization um, and uh, less state and so on. So that's also, and, and through that, uh, I, I'm then in the situation to develop myself, you know, to re be really autonomous. It is the state that hurts my developing uh, autonomous, uh, autonomously. Um, and in one way or the other, uh, we need to also find out about whether those exemplary exemplarily um, uh, aspects of experiences are justified or not. You know, and, and, and standpoint philosophy uh, ha, does not offer, in my view, any tools to judge on right or wrong uh, experiences. And for that one needs then something else uh, to say, well, you know, we have an, a particular idea of freedom, a freedom to overcome um, uh, capitalism or overcome uh, moral indifference and a kind of morality that addresses the common good. And I think it's, it's necessary that we offer something like that, uh, which is linked to a certain idea of morality, which is linked also to something like a content uh, that is uh, like uh, emancipation or solidarity. Um, and we need also more about that. It, it's not enough to have a formal, a, a possibly only formal idea of being dominated. Not that Robin has offered that or that, that Raul Yagis does that, but it's, uh, in my view, we have to, or we, I mean, those who are uh, starting with this negative approach have to have a kind of uh, normative criteria on that, I think. And indifference and morality and different, that's why what I found interested here with Adorno, uh, offers uh, at least a starting point, uh, but for that we need a reflection on morality. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. No, that's that's an important um, challenge. I mean, so so just a few thoughts. I mean, first, um, I mean it's very important. I think that standpoint theory is not about experience. It's also not about feeling. It's to a certain extent uh, irrelevant how people feel, right? I mean, that's why. To say I feel dominated is not is it's is just not a relevant, neither theoretically nor politically um, relevant claim. And that's never the claim from which standpoint theory uh, takes its beginning. That's why it's 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 a standpoint, right? That's why it's the it, that's why it's mediated, not given. That's why it's the outcome of a certain work and not just the affirmation of an immediate um feeling and it's true that one then still has to spell out what precisely that difference amounts to and how you get from uh, here to there but um, uh, I think especially if we look at the cases that you um, referred to uh, you know there's a lot one can say about that so uh, none of which will be uncontested obviously so all of this will be um, itself part of the um, you know, then the then the then the discussion, I guess. But um, so if if you know, let's you know, take take the case of uh, white North Americans now thinking to a quite large uh, empirical, I mean empirically to a quite large percentage that they are the most racially oppressed uh, group um, in the U.S., for example, right? Um, uh, and then turning to you know, let's say Trump uh, as a kind of political uh, outlet. So um, what's there to say about it? I mean, there's, there's many things to say, right? I mean, first of all, uh, it's, that claim is kind of incompatible with all the available sociological and historical uh, 
evidence. Now, of course, you can say that has been fabricated by the liberal elites, etc. But well, then you know, there's no point in, further, in discussing any further because that's just denying the empirical basis of any conversation. So, not all uh, claims by groups to be um, oppressed uh, should be taken at face value or have the same empirical uh, grounding. Uh, second, I think it's important. That's another not necessarily normative criterion, but more one, maybe to a certain extent formal, um, to ask, well, is given the diagnosis, and you know, the diagnosis needs to be empirically assessed, but given, even given this diagnosis, so accepting the diagnosis, is the supposed political solution really a solution? And again, I think a lot of um, uh, the kind of right-wing populist um, stuff uh, clearly fails on that, I mean, that, you know, that was Löwenthal's point in false prophets. You know, there's, there's something wrong and it gets misarticulated already in the problem description. And then it's uh, linked with a pseudo solution. It actually only makes it worse precisely because the pseudo solution is never at the level of the structural sources of the problem if they had described it rightly. But in most cases, at least, personalizes and scapegoats that structural problem into you know that if only we could get rid of that group we would again be uh, you know back in control <laughs> if only we could do this or that to either the elites and or the outsiders they have let in right that's the structure that's also what Adorno analyzes in you know many of his writings on fascism and on the on on um, you know in in his time contemporary right wing um, German uh, movements right that they that they misarticulate a structural problem. Yes, there is a problem with capitalism, but they misarticulate and then they personalize and on that basis make a sort of solution that will never be able to address um, uh, that problem. Um, and then, of course, you have the whole normative dimension that you rightly uh, point to. And that you know pertains both to, um, I guess, the aims. So what is actually the um, let's say envisioned society that underlies these different uh, claims or movements, and um, you know, I would I would think one of the one of the fundamental questions there is, well, is the vision one of um, <clears throat> you know is the is is the vision one that will either continue to rely on or even make worse the kind of exclusion and marginalization that has been part of the existing forms of solidarity? Or is it one that not only tries to include others into that, because that's often not enough, because if what we have has been to a certain extent structurally premised on exclusion, inclusion will not really work, right? We need a kind of transformed, a transformative vision of what, um, what the social order, the political order should look like. Um, and so is the transformative vision that these movements articulate one which, um, you know, again, uh, makes these forms of exclusion worse or manages to a certain extent at least to overcome them. And again, I think there's, a, you know, there's a big difference here between um, movements for I don't know, social or racial or whatever you want to call it, justice and the, and the, <clears throat> the kind of counter movements that we've seen from the, from the right wing. Um, I don't know whether you really need like substantial a substantial account of morality for all that. I mean, I don't want to say that these are non-moral or non-normative questions. Of course, they are normative, but I wonder, you know, how to account for their normativity. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, some some of it, I think you can. Some of these issues, distinctions, I think you can make on a rather a formal or to a certain extent imminent uh, or you know maybe democracy related um, in a democracy related register and then I'm sure that there is still work to do on the kind of substantial moral questions but um, I don't think that they are, they are the presupposition for making all these other um, forms of critique so uh, in that sense I would think it's 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 hopefully uh, complementary um, I mean, just to do one uh, reverse connection with uh, your paper, Regina, I thought um, what was really important and where I think Adorno does indeed, uh, is often indeed uh, misread, 
is in this analysis of uh, totality, because I think you rightly um, point out that the totality that Adorno is talking about is also one which in his own analysis, and this becomes maybe even more clear in his sociological writings, is you know, traversed by contradictions, by um, imminent tensions, uh, that is to a certain extent fragmented, and that is also um, one that, uh, um, you know, social struggles insofar as they do uh, exist um, uh, can to a certain extent break open. Um, but I guess that's the that's the difficult point because, you know, at the same time, Adorno seems to think, well, that's in principle possible, but at the current historical juncture, it isn't really. And I just wonder what you make of that part of his work. I mean, you can sort of read him against himself and say, well, he just had the wrong historical analysis in the 60s and he didn't look far enough to you know, have a less integrationist view of the totality. But in principle, he has the theoretical tools to move beyond that, right? I mean, that's, so you could say, well, it's not a problem really of the theory, it's more a problem of his analysis of the historical uh, constellation. But yeah, I don't know whether you would agree with that or whether you think, um, you know, we can we can simply use him for a more kind of open mm. uh, analysis of the situation of struggles. Oh, exactly. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's why I stopped with uh, the the right the question of the right life is a question of the right politics, uh, and actually, uh, uh, I think uh, you offered. Um, already an interesting interpretation here. And so far, as uh, Ardorno says, well, it's about uh, being remaining sensitive towards all kinds of indifferences. That's the first thing. But uh, actually, what only uh, gets us uh, out of uh, this uh, harsh grip of capitalism, which uh, hinders us or, or, and other blockades, uh, is through politics. And of course, Adorno in the 1960s, he was confronted by a different uh, kind of movements, which he in a way uh, disliked because they personally uh, attacked him as well. Uh, but uh, theoretically, I think that Adorno uh, really give Adorno's approach uh, helps us to understand in how far politics is in a way the only way of opening up um, the um, uh, insensitivity uh, of uh, what is going on. Even so, in my view, he, uh, he never um, uh, spelled that out explicitly, not like um, Habermas, for example, uh, later on, um, because I don't think that that's all intrinsically the negativity, the non, but, but that's also another thing, uh, saying no. I mean, where to say no, not at home, uh, but saying no in public, of course, uh, not taking part, uh, that all uh, does not help us um, in uh, questioning uh, the uh, powerful structures uh, if one does not say it in public together with others. And in that sense, uh, I think one can really uh, make a point here by saying that also Adorno has this idea of uh, being politically uh, uh, someone who thinks it's uh, public and he as an intellectual with his second hat on uh, also knows and he, he knew uh, how important the public sphere was. Uh, so I. I um, completely agree. Also, you can read uh, the self-determination within capitalism, uh, what uh, Maverick also mentioned, uh, is something that uh, materializes itself, actually only in, in uh, shared uh, public action. Now, I completely agree. Another honor, if I, if I may, I don't know, I look at uh, Rodrigo. Uh, I was just a, a little thing here about the uh, standpoint uh, philosophy. So maybe I'm not on the, I haven't read uh, uh, one of those uh, texts, but anyway, I think that at some point the epistemic uh, access, and this is a kind of privileged epistemic access uh, is in my view, in all those standpoint approaches, 
uh, based on the experience. Of course, it's embedded also in the point where you are, uh, um, in how far you are uh, embedded in, in, in structures or like um, uh, capitalism workload, um, uh, family uh, embeddedness and so on. But that's also like Marinda Fricka. I mean, it, you cannot, I think you cannot think what it really means if you have not an idea of uh, the experience, the, the epistemical access of, let's say, being a woman, uh, being uh, maybe a, um, a, a black woman, and all the kinds of discrimination that came out of that. Uh, offers the privileged epistemic access uh, to uh, judging on that particular situation, uttering what was going on here. Um, and, but you had often, I, I would found it really interesting uh, to learn more about then your particular approach here, because if you define that differently, that would uh, you know, overcome a certain problems. Uh, standpoint philosophy, in my view, um, always has. Mm. I mean, maybe just one very brief remark on this. I mean, of course, it depends on the author. But if you look at the historical and sociological studies that you know Du Bois has engaged in, or also Patricia Hill Collins, um, and those are the two main reference points for my argument. I mean, they both. I mean, of course, experience is what is an important reference point and basis, but they all, they both emphasize the need for uh, certain infrastructures, for certain cultural practices, for sub subaltern public spheres, you could say, right? I mean, when you look at uh, Patricia Hill Collins' argument for why Black women, in her view, were able to develop a critical standpoint on gender and race relations because before white women were able to do that, it's not simply because of the experience, it's because there was the black church that provided the public space for them to come together, which white women, I mean, to speak very globally now, obviously it's much more complicated, but in their isolated, um, you know, uh, middle-class existence didn't have access to. It's because even in, uh, you know, segregationist and even in, 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 in the slavery economy, they were, ways of coming together and you know producing knowledge together as it were that allowed that experience to be articulated um, uh, uh, you know to a certain extent uh, be made into something more than just uh, experience and and uh, that's what I think is in, in important and that's what I think explains why you know just being um, oppressed in itself is also not something that enables this. It has to go together with these practices, infrastructures, uh, public spheres. I mean, what, what Lisa yesterday called, um, I think she did speak of epistemic infrastructure. So that's, I found that pre pretty helpful. And this, you know, these can be vocabularies as Fricker uh, talks about it, but this can be much more materialistically understood as well as I think um, Du Bois and Collins understand it. And, you know, partly, the, you know, just as Adorno was a public intellectual who tried to, in a certain sense, uh, through his practice, change the diagnosis that he theorized. Um, I mean, Du Bois, as a public intellectual, tried to bring about more of these infrastructures for, for um, the experience that individuals might be stuck with to become something that can be politically transformative. Um, but of course, I agree that especially in, uh, let's say, a lot of popularized um, contemporary uh, references to standpoint theory or what one might call identity politics, there is a complete abstraction from these material conditions of possibility of developing a standpoint over time, and it gets more framed in direct experiences of individuals that cannot be questioned or whatever. I mean, but in the theory, I think, or in the theoretical discussion, and that's really not the picture I think that emerges. So, yeah. But thanks for the for um, pushing that point. I think it's really important. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank both uh, Professor Salicatis and Professor Craig for the really interesting um, papers and also the discussion. And um, with that, I would um, close the, this 
panel, but I would like to invite you to the next one, which will take place in about half an hour. Um, the panel is going to be, um, we'll have two presentations, one by Just Serrano, Art Articulando lo Social, Democracia y Dominación Expresiva, and the other one by Gustavo Robles, Subjetividad, Economía de Plataforma y Neoliberalismo Autoritario. Brevemente en español, agradecer de nuevo a ambos profesores eh, por la discusión y por sus trabajos muy interesantes y asimismo invitar al público a la siguiente mesa de discusión que tendrá lugar en más o menos 30 minutos con las ponencias de Jus Serrano y Gustavo Robles. Muchas, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Gracias a todos. Muchas gracias. And I'll thank you again, Maverick. We just exchanged also a few words. And Rodrigo, thank you okay. for this nice moderation. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everybody, um, for, for listening. And um, hope seeing you soon at some point. <laughs> thank you.